cha um, chapter 11, verse 25 to 27. Hang on one second. He's on the red one. <coughs> Try me. Got it? Okay, here. We're going to cheat. We're going we're gonna to cheat. Give me a second. See, I can, I can do more than one thing. I'm really good, Michael. John, John chapter 11, 20, verse, 20, verse 25 to 27. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever, believe, whoever believes in me, for, for he died, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. At this point in time, we're going to ask the kids that want to go to the children's church. You are now dismissed at this time. Well, I try to figure out how to put my microphone back on. Because this is a lot easier when everybody's doing it in front of a mirror. There. Hopefully you'll stay on. So we're so glad to be able to offer Children's Church and do those types of things. Uh, I don't know if I've shared this with you. I'm going to share this publicly with you. Okay, I've shared this privately with a number of people. Um, my 2021 prayer um, was uh, one of the things that I've been praying for was I, I wanted I, I prayed for enough kids for us to do Children's Church by the end of the year. Amen. Okay, that was my prayer. Amen. God answered that in February. So I've got to now start praying for something else. So. Um, it's one of those neat things where I'm just able to, you know, I, I don't know if you do this, uh, please do, if you've never started this spiritual uh, exercise, when you, if you have a prayer list, write them down, and then check them off, or, or put a line through them, because it reminds you of what God's already done, and that's a beautiful thing, okay? I'm hoping to use that as a great segue into our scripture today. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to John chapter 11. Now, what's, what's great about John chapter 11 is that we are at the end of, kind of the end of a series. Um, we got there really quickly. Um, I want you to know, uh, John chapter 11 is the, is the sign, the raising of Lazarus, okay? This is a sermon that you've probably heard a number of times. But I want you to see how it, how it fits into the, the overall context of things, number one. And then number two is I want you to see exactly... Uh, what, how I feel like John, one of the reasons John put it in here was for us, us individually, us as a church, us future, because it's one of those things that we are able to look back on Lazarus' resurrection with an eye towards Easter, okay? Uh, starting next week, uh, the series is going to change. We're still going to be in the Gospel of John, but next week we're going to start the series of, going, of, our, of our walk to walk towards Easter, okay? So there's a you know, and no, I don't know. I heard, I saw some of you. Uh, What's well, great? I'm standing up here and watching the, the announcements. Uh, we talked about daylight savings time, and a number of you went, "Really? Is it already time for that?" Yes. And there's two guys. There's two times of people. There's the people that get excited for daylight savings time, and then there's everyone else, right? And I'm one of those people that get excited because I'm a morning person, and I like to see the sun still at 7 p.m. at night. You know, it's one of those things. But, I, but this is one of those things where I really do think that if we were to read it correctly, we could read this in such a way that it's for us today. So, let's, have, let's talk a little bit about what's happening between chapters 9, 10, and 11, okay? These three chapters are, are, are fastened in such a way that I don't know how you read Scripture. I, I don't. I, I, some, people, some people are able to open it up, and they're able to read, like, a verse, and they're just, I'm good. You know? They're that type of people. Great. If you're one of those, well, great. I'm not, because um, I'll, I'll start reading a verse, and then by the time I get done with it, I've read like three chapters, okay? It's just, just the way that I read, because I want to read sort of contextually. Chapter 9, chapter 10, and chapter 11 go really well together, okay? Um, if you ever decide to read this, you can write yourself a little note right here. Uh, if, ever, you know, if you ever go back through your studying it, read chapters 9, 10, and 11 together. One sitting won't take you that long. Because this is what's sort of interesting that's happening. Because Lazarus probably might be the, the climax, we'll use that word, of the story right now between these three chapters. Let's go back. Chapter 9, 
was the healing of the blind man. Why do I, why do I start off with that? Well, because guess what they're going to talk about in chapter 11? The healing of the blind man. All right? Lazarus is, uh, he's from Bethany. You get that 11, chapter 1. Now, a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, in the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. Now, uh, what's interesting is, is John does this. Now, this is the second time he's done it. Because remember, going all the way back to the feeding of the 5,000, he does this with Philip, right? Philip was, Philip was of, uh, of Bethesda. He was from the area. What John here is doing is he's telling you this is Lazarus, this is the family, and they're from Bethany. Interesting, okay? Side note. And right around about 1800, we'll make sure I got my, my note here correct. Uh, right around about 1873, okay, the archaeologists went back to this area and they started digging around in around Bethany. They found a tomb. Do you want to know whose names are on it? Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And you go, it's one of those things where like, yeah, we can say these were common names and that's fine. But it is, don't you just find it sort of interesting and a little bit of a one to chuckle going, what's the likelihood of finding all three of these names together? Unless they were a family. Hmm, what family do we happen to know of that happens to have these three names in it? Well, there's a little family from Bethany. What's also interesting in this fact is that in chapter 10, Jesus is teaching, I am the good shepherd. And at the end of chapter 10, I hope you were, uh, Wednesday night, I try to talk about this on Facebook Live. Jesus leaves and he sort of, he goes back to where John the Baptist was first baptizing. Okay? He's across the River Jordan. He's a couple of miles away from Jerusalem. It's not like he's hiding, okay? He's just not in the mainstream of things right at the moment. He didn't go into the city of Jerusalem, and he's not there. He's outside the gates. But this is where he's at in chapter 10. Chapter 11, then, is Lazarus. He appears in the gospel story not because of any shining qualities that Lazarus has. Tell me. Why did Lazarus, why was Lazarus the one chosen? Did he do something? No. Was he, uh, was he somebody? You know, was he a, an officer's son or was he a Pharisee? No. All we're told about this family is that they're believers. And we actually, what's sort of interesting is we actually spend more time with this little family in the, in the Gospels than we almost do Jesus' own personal family. So that shows you how, how connected they are. They are, uh, I was trying to remember what our family, our family usually uses, uh, our, you know, whenever we get asked, is that, are they family? They're non-blood related family, right? We just, we're just all part of one big family. That's sort of how Jesus is with these three. They're, he cares for them deeply. And so I want to leave this there for you so that you understand that we're, we're, we're building, Okay. But raising Lazarus is interesting because of the action and reaction of Jesus. Now, in chapter 11, unlike other chapters, I always want to, especially when we're talking about certain things like this, because this is a big chapter. I don't have enough time to sort of read all of it. There are, there's neighbors who are here. Why are the neighbors there? Okay, let's make it, okay, it's not... Let's make them good Southerners, right? Whenever someone, when someone passes away, what do they, what do good neighbors do? Good Southern neighbors do? Bring food. I'm gonna come and sit and talk with you, right? I can't tell you the number of number of times I've been to people's houses to either take food or just to sit and talk, right? I want you to know this is happening all the way back in Bible times. You can actually go all the way back to Job. This is the same thing that's happening. So family, neighbors are, are gathering around them. Remember, this is day three. So they've had, they've had some time. You also have, obviously, in this story, you have Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So let's dive into Scripture together just for a moment. Verse number five, but just to explain the, what he, how the view of Jesus, verse number five, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. I always like this because 
we can, everybody wants to pick on, well, does he, does, didn't he just say at the beginning of that verse that he loved them? Yes, it does, because I'm going to show you how Jesus is going to show love, which is different. Verse number 13, jump down there, and he tells them that Lazarus, Lazarus had fallen asleep. Now, Jesus has spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant that he was taking a rest and sleep. Again, I try, to, I try not to give the disciples too much credit, and neither do I try to give them too much of a hard time. Jesus said that he was asleep. What do the disciples instantly think? Oh, well, then he could be woken up. They really did think he was really asleep. And probably like maybe in like what we what we would call today a coma. He's just he's just asleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. I love this because guess who told him this? Who told him this in verse 13? No. What? He's God. He knew. <laughs> then Jesus told him, verse 15, And for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. So this is what's happened. You like my little, I don't, I don't know how else to explain that, that Lazarus was dead. So Lazarus has died. And he waited. And Jesus actually looks at him and says, and for your sake, I'm really glad that, he's, that, he, that he did die. And he's sort of past tense, he's been dead. Why? Because I'm going to show you, disciples, I'm going to give you a precursor of what's getting ready to happen in a couple more weeks. Okay? That's exactly what Jesus is doing right here. But what do... What, did, what does Thomas say? And I want you to know, we, what do we usually call Thomas? We call him Doubting Thomas, right? Because he was the one who had to go stick his finger in you know, Jesus' side. Which, by the way, I'm, I'm very interested in because no one else seemed to. But this is actually his shining moment. Verse number 16, the, so Thomas, called the twin, said to the other his other fellow disciples, the disciples, let us go that we may die with him. Uh, typically in these fold, in these illustrations, I usually have one other group up here that's a giant stop sign. Do you notice they're not here? It's the Jews, the Jewish officials. What are they trying to do? Kill Jesus. So what does Thomas think that this is all lining up for happening? We're all going to die. But, isn't that interesting? What does Thomas say? It is, it's not just, oh, we're all going to die, so let's run the other way. What does Thomas say? Let's go. This, this is his shining moment, by the way. Let's go. So we can die with him. He's going to be a friend. He's going to be loyal. He's going to be a disciple until the very end. Let us go with him. But it's a resurrection of life, right? And, and, and I'm not going to read you the whole story, but because you've had so many other sermons on it, right? You had so, I, I, mean, I mean, if I was to tell you we're going to do a sermon on Lazarus, most of you would go, okay, I've already heard that. But let's, let's sort of skip some of the things that you already know, right? He shows up. Who's the first one to meet him? Let's go to Judea. And what's interesting is Martha, Jesus, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours a day if anyone walks at night? And we see you going. Now Jesus spoke to her death and sleep. Verse 14. Now verse 17. And Jesus came and found that Lazarus had already been dead and in the tomb for four days. So, died. Took the time to prepare. Took the time to bury him. And has been dead now for four days. Why is this important? What, is it, what has Jesus been telling his disciples now? Go to the other Gospels. What has he been telling them now for a very long time? What's he been saying? I will tear down the temple, and I will rise it again in three days. Lazarus has been dead for four days. You know, you would think, yeah, this is the reason why I go back to us as we're on this side of the cross, we looking at all this going, yeah, we understand it. The disciples never did pick up on it, and that's okay, I don't give them a hard time. But Lazarus has been dead for four days. So verse 23. So he's talking with, and he, can't, he just keeps on going. And Jesus answered her, your brother will rise again. 
I always like that. Martha's then response was what? I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. I want you to, can I tell you something really quickly here? Uh, for all the, uh, and especially ladies, I want you to know there's not too many, there's not too many really great examples in scripture, okay, of, of, of women. And, and, and that's just an obvious statement, okay? Um, you have perfect sinner and perfect saint. You have Mary, the mother of Jesus, and you have Eve, right? And you think through it. There's just not a whole lot of great women examples in scripture. This is one of them. And this is a time that she shot really well. Because what, what, is, what, is, what was her response? Jesus said, he's going to rise again. And, the disciple, and she's going there, I know you've taught on that. I was listening. She was a good student. What did she say? She goes, I know you that you will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus answered her and said, what? I am the resurrection. He's using, he's recalling back to, to Abraham, telling him, I am, but he goes, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into this world. So she has faith and she has good theology. She has an understanding of who Jesus is. He is the Christ. She has an understanding of what he taught. She believes it completely. She's answered him. Now, where, where would we be good God, Bible scholars, 1 Thessalonians 4.13, right? What do we say? What do we usually say at funerals? And I even prayed it a little bit during my, during my prayer. But do not be inf uninformed, brothers, that about those who are asleep. And do not, give, uh, do not grieve as others who do not have hope. Since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring those with him who have fallen asleep. We have hope. Mary and Martha are in the place before the Holy Spirit, but they're still having hope. They still have good theology. They still have faith. Verses 23 through 27. Now, I want you to jump down because this is exactly what, what would you expect if, if, if again, if you're talking with one sister and you've answered her and the other sister comes out, what would you have to do? You have to explain things all over again, wouldn't you? And that's exactly what happens. Again, don't let, I don't know about you, but make sure whenever you're reading God's word, especially when you're reading Jesus, make him here with us. Don't just say, oh, Jesus only had to say it once and never had to repeat himself. No. Again, look at what happens. Verse 28, then she said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. Need both sisters here. Why? You're going to want to see this. And, but this is what he does. He doesn't. He, he talks again. So she, she rose quickly. She went out. We jump all the way down to verse number 34. Because this is where we have to get our next one. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come and see. Verse 35. And I want you to know, um, this is usually... Everybody was asking me whenever I, uh, some people were asking me whenever uh, we started doing scripture reading. Are you going to let anyone read, you know, John eleven thirty five, 35, Jesus wept? Like, no. Why? Because every, uh, every little kid I've ever known has stood up and, and quoted that one verse, right? Why? It's easy. Two words. Jesus wept. But why did he cry? We'll talk about that in just a moment. So they said to him, who's they? See how he loved them. It's not, it's not Mary and Martha. They know this. So who's, who's, whose viewpoint is this from? All those that are gathered around. Oh, they're going back to the gravesite. I guess we should go with them. And so they all start walking and they're, they're seeing, they're really close to Jesus. And what do they see Jesus doing? They see Jesus crying. It says he wept. I don't know about you, but whenever I think about weeping, I, I, all I can think about is what I call ugly crying, right? Where you're crying so hard, the tears are falling down your face. 
whenever I think about weeping, that's really what I think of. Because I think about little kids, right? I think about little kids when they're not, they're not getting their way, or, you know, they're just, just completely broke down, you know. That's what I think of. I sometimes think about Jesus. I let Jesus cry that way. I let him cry. Let him mourn. Why? Because it shows that he's human. It shows that he understands exactly why he understands, but yet he still is going to go through the process because it's what the Father determined. It's what they, as, as part of, of God, have determined. This is what you want to happen. And so he weeps. And so a question is, a belief is coming from the neighbors. Verse number 37. Let's go ahead and jump down there with me. But some of them said, could, could not he be the, uh, who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying. Remember last week when I, I said there's going to be a point sometimes whenever the group actually asks the right question just with the wrong motives? Here they are again. Hey, you know what? He healed that blind man. Couldn't he? Could, no, if he'd, have, if he'd been here, couldn't he have just, you know, kept Lazarus alive? Wouldn't that have been a great, you know, they're, 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 again, they're not believers. Wouldn't that have been a great entertainment value? We know, we know he's going to die, but as long as Jesus would have been here, been okay. Verse number thirty-nine. This is where this is. I want you to know it takes you it takes you thirty-nine verses to actually get to the sign in this chapter. Jesus said, "Take the stone, take away the stone." And Mary, the sister, the sister of the dead man, said to him, "One of my favorite. Okay, if you have a King James Bible, I have this line underlined." Uh, by the Lord, by this time there will be an odor. I love the, I love the King James in this. It says he stinketh, Lord. You ever been around someone and they stinketh? I use that I use that word often. Okay, I get around somebody else and they go, you stinketh. And they go, where did that come from? Bible, John John chapter eleven. For he has uh, for he's been dead four days. I love this. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So it's not just, here's the, it's not just raising a smelly Lazarus. Okay? Because he stunk. But what is it? The power of resurrection. Do you believe? You go back. John, Jesus is here saying, do you believe? Yes, I believe, Lord. Well, then roll the stone away. Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Verse 41, so they took away the stone. I don't know what's running through their head. Do you know what's running through their head? What in the world is he going to do? Here's Mary and Martha going, okay, what's he going to do? I don't know. Could you just see them over there whispering to the disciples? Hey, John, <laughs> what's he going to do? I have no idea. <laughs> but I want to watch. Right? So they rolled away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this on the count of the people standing around, that they believe that you sent me. Let's go back. For the last three chapters, Jesus has done nothing but try to help them understand that he's been sent by the Father. He and the Father are one. There's a moment where he's praying and he's praying aloud. And he's praying in such a way that other people can hear him. And what does he pray? I'm, God, I, I'm thankful that I have a moment like this to show that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice. Right? Lazarus, rise, Lazarus, come out. Okay, now I don't know about you again. I don't know what you do when you read scripture. Every time I read this, what do I, you know what I think about? He's not going, okay, Lazarus, come out. Right? What's he doing? He's yelling, Lazarus. He's loud. Lazarus, come out. And he does it so loud that his voice could echo all the way through the tomb. Jesus never touched him. He never had to put a hand on him. And I want you to see 
the opposite of the blind man, because the blind man, what did he do? He rubbed mud on his eyes. Where, where, what does this refer, refer back to? I'm going all the way back to Genesis. In the beginning, God created. How did he create? He spoke. How did life form in Genesis? God spoke. Here, how does God raise him from the dead? He spoke. That's it. And then the man who had died, been dead for four days, and I don't know about you, but Mary and Martha are probably over here with like their mouth all on the floor, right? The man who died came out. His hands and feet were still bound. His face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him. And let him go. He's, he was dead. Again, let's go back. Mary and Martha are standing there. What's he going to do? I don't know. Pray. Wow. <laughs> I was coming out. No. No. He not no. And then what happens? Here they see his, his brother, the, their brother, doing what? Walking out. Barely able to walk out. His feet mouth. He's probably walking. Right? Why? He was, he was dead. What do they do with dead people? They bind them up. Here comes Lazarus. Why? Because God is the power of resurrection. Unbind him and let him go. We read all of this, and this is where I want us to get us back to. This is, this is right now. The blessing of a sign. There's a question mark here. You're going, what? Yeah. Because this is where I really do want us to put uh, ourselves into this. Again, I don't know where you read scripture and how you how you think about things. I always put my, I always try to figure out, you know, where would I be in this story, right? <laughs> Most of the time, I put myself as an outsider, going, I don't think he's going to be able to do any of this, right? That's where I, I don't know about you, but that's where I put myself. This is one of the few stories. Guess where you should put yourself as? Lazarus. What does, God, what does God's word say about, what does God's word say to Paul? It says you were dead. From what? You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Until what? Until God. Ephesians chapter 1. But God. Breathe life into us. But God died on the cross. Why? So that we may have life. I don't know about you, but if you're saved, the person you should put yourself as is Lazarus. Why? Let's talk about it really quickly. Well, again, let's go back. What did Lazarus do to receive the blessing or to be part of the sign? What did he, what did he do? Nothing. He didn't do anything. He didn't. Jesus said he loved, we, we read, Jesus loved this family. And yet Lazarus died. What's interesting to read through this is that you could end up thinking about, wow, did he, you know, did he, did he do something to earn it? No. So let's go back to Wednesday night. If you've not watched Wednesday night, go back on Facebook Live, go back and watch it. Did he, did he, did he do anything to earn it? No. Did he do anything? Did hey, did Jesus owe him a favor? No. Did Jesus, did, did Lazarus pray, God, you know, I'm, I'm going to die here in about a month. Um, if you'd be around, that'd be great. Did he make that kind of a, of a deal with him? No. There's times in our lives whenever God says he was going to bless us, and there's nothing we did about it. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. We didn't, not, we didn't do anything about it. Do you know where I really turned that into? It's my salvation. The more I think about my salvation, there's nothing I did. Nothing. I didn't wake up one day and go, God, you know what? If you save me, I can make a deal with you. Is that how it worked? No. What does God's word say? Before time began, God looked through it and said he saw you and me and knew that we needed a way back to him. Isn't that neat? That's something to think about before creation ever existed. God was... You already thinking, he was already thinking about you. And wait, you know what? The world needs one of you. So he makes one. 
And then he makes a way for you to come back to him. So what did he and his family have to endure because of? Oh, oh you mean, that, mean there's sometimes I may have to endure for a blessing? Hmm, maybe. Let's be real. Four did. What did, what, did, what did Mary and Martha have to suffer for four days? The loss of a loved one. They had good theology. I know God, you said you're going to raise them in the last day. I, I don't, I'm not mourning like the rest of the world mourns. But guess what? I'm still sad. They had to, they knew he was dead. He was dead dead. Okay? Medical terms. <laughs> There's three levels of dead. He was dead, dead, dead. He was so dead that, well, go back, what, what did they say about him? Lord, he stinks. He is stinking dead. Okay? Now you can laugh at that, that's funny. But what else did he have to do? They had to endure that. They had to endure people coming saying, I'm so sorry for your loss. I'm so sorry that you lost a brother. They didn't endure that. And then you're going. But, you know, they get to see the blessing. Understand that Lazarus dies before the cross and then doesn't die again until after the cross. Lazarus was, was dead for four days. Could you imagine what he said? Well, he said <laughs> Where were you at? I was in the presence of God. Exciting. I want you, if you have your Bible, if it's not already open to it, my Bible is, turn over to, to chapter 12, verse number 9. You want to know one of the side effects of this blessing? When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only to account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Verse number 10, so the chief priest made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. What did they have to endure? Yeah, they got their brother back. What did they have to spend the rest of their lives doing? Waiting for the Jews to come. They were going to come and kill, the, kill his brother. Why? Why are they going to kill, why are they going to kill Lazarus? God performed a sign. He was dead. They know he was dead, but he's back. And here's Lazarus telling them, I was dead. I was dead. <laughs> Let's go back. So why did, you know, we can talk about a number of things. There's a difference between saying you care and showing you care. Now, this is how we're going to wrap this up today, because I want you to see how Jesus, the, the action and reaction of what Jesus is trying to teach you. There's a difference between saying you care and showing you care. And this all comes from Jesus and his reaction with the family from, Beth from Bethany. Let's go back to the famous verse. What is the famous verse? The two, two little word verse is what? Jesus wept. Why would he cry? Number one, they're believers. They understand. They have to have a really good theology about the end times and about how this is all going to work. And Jesus is getting here and going... I'm going to have to explain so much more to them in here in about five more minutes, right? Make them a good teacher. But then also make him sit there and go, no, no, no. Let him cry. And why is he going to cry? Guess what Lazarus has to do again in, not too, in the not too dear future? He has to die for a second time. It is appointed to man for what? Once to die. And then the resurrection. Jesus cried. Why? Lazarus has to die twice. He has to go through this whole process all over again. And couldn't you just imagine Mary and Martha on the second time that Lazarus died? I think he's going to stay dead this time. Right? And then we go, no, no, no. He's going to rise again. Just in the last day. Jesus cares because he's showing that he cares. 
Also, let's talk about this. Belief to action. Two great examples of this are actually in Thomas and Mary. You can believe and you can have it all thought out in your head the best that you can. What's always interesting to me is whenever someone has to go through something and see if all the beliefs hang on. Because you can think about it all the time. It's not until the pressure that hits you, the pressure of the world, are you, gonna, are you actually going to do what you believe? Two of them in this story actually do. Number one is Thomas. Thomas' is a shining moment. Again, what does it say? Let us go. Let's die with him. If, if this is the end, let's go. Number two is Mary. I love this. She goes, I believe. I believe he's going to rise in the last day. But I still wish he had been here. Jesus said, I was, <laughs> you almost hear Jesus going, I was here. Because what does it confirm in our faith? You know what this is? This is where we get excited. Jesus is the resurrection. He is the resurrection. I don't know about you. I, I'm going to tell you two, you two examples. I had to do a funeral of, of, a, of a man, of a sort of younger man. And I went to that family, and my first question to them was, he saved. You know what the family told me? We don't know. If you need to know, our best guess is still, still no. The saddest funeral I ever had to do was that funeral of God because it was trying to help provide hope in a way that I can't, couldn't offer it. I had to go back and say, you know, for him it was, the decision is too late, but for you today there's an opportunity. I, I put that on one book in, and I put the other book in on, on, a, on, a, on a funeral that I did where we, it was, it was a celebration of life, right? I, one of the easiest funerals I ever did. Why? Because the sermon was almost written for me. All I had to do was go and just, just share. Why? Because none of the family had had worries about where he was. What were they? They were doing exactly what Jesus said. He says, I am the resurrection of life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Amen. And whenever, whenever I got to do the, other, the, the, first, the second funeral, it was exciting. Why? We were not mourning the way the world mourns. Yeah, we miss. We're going, we're, we're going to miss him. We, we talked about how we were going to miss him. But guess what? Okay. We're going to miss him. But guess what? We do know. We know that, there, that, he's going to, that there's going to be a day of reunion again. Jesus is the, is the resurrection. I don't know about where you are today, but let me leave you with the exact last words of what Jesus wrote, in, or what Jesus said in verse number 25. He says, do you believe this? I don't know where you are today. If you do not believe that Jesus is the resurrection, today is a beautiful day to do so. Today is just a, a wonderful time to, to, to take, a, take a moment and to get this correct with God. What does God's word say for us? I go, I go back to Romans 10. I quote it almost every week. It says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. That's it. Do you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth? If you've done that, then you understand that Jesus is the resurrection. There's something for us to look forward to. And if you don't, I want you to know that does not change the fact that Jesus is the resurrection. And there is something that, that's going to happen to look forward to. I'm not sure you are going to be looking forward to it. Why? Because there's going to be judgment. Jesus is the resurrection. And today's a great day to get it right with God. Here, so here in just a moment, I want to ask you to do is I'm actually going to buy a little bit of time. Uh, we have one more thing to do after we get done praying. So at this point in time, I am going to ask you to please stand. I'm going to pray for us just for a moment. Uh, Tony, don't worry about any music right now. We'll just, we'll just go. I want us just to take a moment to pray.
if you are if you are here today and you do not know Christ as Savior, today is a beautiful day for you to come and, and, and make this right with God. To make it make it clear. As God says simply, if, you, if I believe and I confess, it says I am saved. And if that's where you are today, here in just a moment, I'm going to pray. And I want you to pray along with me. But number two, for so many of us, we may exa exactly be exactly right where Lazarus was. And going, God, I, I, I don't know why, why I'm going through this. And I don't know why you're blessing me, continuing to bless me. But you are. We have to continue to go back and remember that Jesus is the resurrection. So let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this day. God, I thank you for this opportunity. God, I pray that as we are reading your word, may it be a challenge to us, God. May we not just see, but God, may, may we use the Holy Spirit to understand what's happening, what you're doing, what you did. For God, we're getting ready to, to start the study on, on Easter and the crucifixion and the resurrection. But you showed the disciples here <laughs> weeks before that you are the resurrection. God, we pray that you will help us in our belief. We pray that you will help us in our understanding. We pray you just help us as we continue to study, continue to move forward. God, I thank you for all of your wonderful blessings, and I, I do uh, ask all these things in your name. Amen. Go ahead. Uh, we've got just a couple of other things we want to go ahead and do uh, really quickly. Uh, I want to go ahead and remind you.